I'm going to talk about um, my latest work and um, I will start with the motivation. So to give this presentation, I came here um, um, from Germany to San Diego and obviously I needed mobile internet to get an Uber here to this nice venue. And because I'm from Germany, I don't have any subscription here. So what I did is to visit the website of my local provider um, from Germany and book a data, data plan for one week, which is qu quite expensive because it's like 40 bucks. And so today I'm going to show you how an attacker can impersonate, impersonate me and to not book one data plan, but maybe 100 data, data plans. And so I have to pay about 400 bucks because of a security issue in the LTE specification. So the question is, why is this even possible? Because LTE has some cool security aims like mutual authentication where the identity um, of the provider is confirmed and even um, the providers knows who you are talking to. We have traffic confidentiality which protects against passive eavesdropping attacks and we have because we are in the mobile environment, we have like um, security aims like identity and location confidentiality. So today we are going to break this first central security aim of LTE, which is mutual authentication. And the question is, um, why is this the case? So mutual authentication is established at the beginning of each connection based on shared keys on your SIM card and the mo mobile networks operator and with a secure AKA protocol. So we are not going to focus on this AKA protocol. We are going to focus on the subsequent co connection and what kind of um, security measures are implemented there. So for this, we first need to differentiate between the control plane traffic and the user plane traffic. The control plane traffic is basically the management traffic, LTE specific, um, and so to get you an internet connection. So all the authentication and LTE specific protocols are implemented in the control plane. You, the user plane data is basically your IP connection, the TCP connection. So the control plane traffic is encrypted and integral, integrity protected. So for encryption, we use the stream cipher. However, the user plane and a user plane traffic is only encrypted with the stream cipher and not integrity protected. And not integrity protecting, yeah, not integrity protecting data leads to serious consequences. So we are in the case now where we have malleable encryption. So malleable encryption allows you to modify encrypted data. The school book example for this is to have a wire transfer, for example, with $10. You encrypt the packet, you encrypt the message with the wire transfer, but not integrity protected. And as an attacker cannot um, access basically the, the um, data, but knows where around the $10 stands, um, it can manipulate um, these and make from this $10, $100. Sending this message, manipulated message, over the channel again to the receiver, the receiver decrypts it, thinks it's valid, and has no means to see any manipulation. In particular, um, stream ciphers, where you basically just XOR the message with a, with a stream of keys, um, is vulnerable to this attack if you not additionally integrity protect this message. And this is the case for LTE and even for 5G. So we have already shown that this malleable encryption in LTE leads to wide consequences last year on um, Oakland. So an attacker in the man in the middle position between your phone and the network can redirect you to a malicious web page. And for example, he can steal credentials and so on. So the question is, can it be worse? And yes, it can be worse with impact. Okay, anyway. Impact stands for impersonation attacks in 4G networks and can be deployed in two variants. First of all, we have the uplink impersonation. So an attacker can impersonate you in the uplink direction 
and the provider thinks that the data comes from you, but it's actually from the, um, from the, from the attacker. And in downlink direction, so the attacker can basically um, send messages or traffic to your phone um, on the user plane, and they both break the central security aim of mutual authentication in both directions. So why is this possible? We already know that there's malleable encryption in LTE, and what we, the second ingredient we exploit for this attack is a reflection mechanism. I will later explain what the reflection mechanism is, and um, just assume that this is there. Both kind of ingredients allow us to build an encryption oracle and decryption oracle. So we can generate valid encrypted packets towards the network and even towards the phone and decrypt incoming packets. Both allow us to impersonate not only you, but also the network in the other direction. So what is the reflection mechanism? And I think all of you have already used, maybe today or in the last few months, the reflection mechanism we exploit for this attack. Um, it's an ICMP ping request and the response to it. So just to remind, remind you, the ICMP ping request um, is sent from your computer to a host and he is um, having some payload data in it with a ping request and your phone will respond to it and copying, copying the original data from the first packet. So the idea of the attack is to use the malleable encryption to transform a normal packet, like a UDP packet, into a ping request and then use a valid key stream again um, to encrypt your own data with it. So just to give you an example here, we will focus today on the uplink encryption oracle. The aim of the uplink encryption oracle is um, to send a valid data with the identity, in this case the IP, of the UE um, towards a targeted server. So the targeted server is on the right there. For that, the attacker has deployed two kind of entities. First of all, we have in the internet, somewhere in the cloud, um, the, um, the encryption, uh, the key stream generation server. And we are in the middle, man in the middle position between the UE and the network. So how does the attack work? In the first step, the key stream generation server sends a UDP packet towards the network. Most networks, mobile networks, have a NAT. So um, we need to assume here that we already have a NAT um, port open, which translates to the internal IP of the UE. We need just to assume this in this case, um, we have the preparation phase where we open this NAT. However, um, just assume that this NAT is open here. So the network will tra translate the incoming connection to the UE, and for radio layer, um, for the radio layer transmission, the network will encrypt this packet with a key stream, um, with a key stream, valid key stream, and sends it on the radio layer to the relay because we are in the man in the middle position. Now the relay transforms this, this message, this UDP packet with its own payload to an ICMP ping request. And forwards it to the UE. Now the reflection mechanism comes into place and the UE will reflect the original packet with the ICMP echo reply. Or again, with the original payload of, um, of the Keystream generation server. Again, the man in the middle intercepts this and he is basically now, due to the malleable encryption, able to calculate, um, commute, compute the original key stream, a valid key stream, which he then reuses to encrypt his own packet towards the network. So this is how we can basically put in our own, own, um, own content in an arbitrary kind of um, packet. 
The network received this packet with a valid key stream, has no means to um, somehow um, verify the origi origin of this packet, and further forwards it to the targeted server. Of course, we have changed the destination IP to the targeted IP we would like to do because of the malleable encryption. So, This is the idea of the uplink encryption oracle. So we have built also a downlink decryption oracle based on the reflection mechanism. I don't want to go into detail with that. But just to give you an idea, to fully impersonate a victim on the IP layer, we can use both kind of oracles to enchain them together to build a fully functional TCP connection. So we start, for, um, we start with the uplink encryption to send a TCP SYN packet towards the targeted server, and the subsequent connection, um, we use the downlink decryption, again, the uplink encryption, and so on. So just to give you an idea. So we performed some experiments in a commercial network with a commercial phone, not modified at all. We built the man in the middle uh, attacker based on um, SRS LTE, which is an open source software stack. And we performed three kind of um, attacks. The first two um, are the impersonation attacks, uplink impersonation attacks. First of all, we visit a, visited a website which is only accessible by the victim itself. In our case, this was our local provider, pass.telecom.de, and we uploaded a 10 kilobyte file to a server with the IP, with the identity of the victim, and we performed also one downlink impersonation attack where we built up a simple TCP connection sending commands to the phone. It is important to note that um, this attack does not require any user interaction because we intercept or we start the um, attack with the first connectivity shed every phone does. In the case of Android, this is connectivityshed.android.com. So, I would like to go through the consequences of this attack, because we showed that it's possible to impersonate a victim or even the network towards, um, yeah, towards each other. So, mutual authentication is one of the most central security aims in LTE, and providers heavily rely on this mutual authentication. For example, for overbilling, we have seen in the beginning the example that I can buy, um, that I can buy like a data plan based on the authentication given by the provider, and this can be used for overbilling and authorization purposes for the attacker. So, providers cannot rely anymore on their mutual authentication. We have law enforcement agencies. In case of investigations, um, law enforcement agencies request your identity based on your public IP, and the providers give out your, the identity. And for example, if an attacker can upload a secret company document in your name, you will be blamed for this activity and you are really in trouble. First of all, uh, last but not least, providers. Providers, uh, uh, users, so users are affected by all two together, so they're getting built and they're getting in trouble. But this is also a privacy threat because there are service websites where, um, where basically your um, phone number is displayed and an attacker can um, map your phone number directly with the permanent identity called IMSI. Furthermore, the downlink um, impact attack allows an attacker to circumvent any firewall or NUT mechanism established by the provider. And this is in particular of importance of IoT devices which are badly configured, have open ports, open configuration ports. So basically an attacker can war drive around an area looking what kind of IoT devices are open and directly access them. So coming to my conclusion, so the only mechanism which protects against these attacks is an integrity protection. And I mean, we have LTE deployed for nearly 10 years, and it's fully specified and deployed. And I think it's quite unlikely, uh, unlikely that any integrity protection on the user plane will be um, added to LTE. 
However, we can still do something about 5G. Currently in the 5G specification, um, integrity protection is optional. It's limited to kind of 64 kilobit per second. And the current deployment will not integrity protect user plane data. So these are also vulnerable to that. So that is why we emphasize the need for mandatory integrity protection in 5G. And that's how I want to end my talk. And I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you for the insightful talk. Uh, Peter Thermos from New Jersey. Okay. Uh, I have a number of questions, but I'll limit it to two. Um, <laughs> So the first one is, in your paper, you described that the actual device was in a um, Faraday enclosure to avoid uh, signal propagation. Yeah. But uh, it doesn't indicate anything about the USRP, the actual ROG in OB. Was that also in an enclosure, or is that an assumption? So this was, so the experiments we did, we did all everything in the shielding box. And we, perf so the UE, so the phone was in the shielding box together with the USRP. Um, the question is how this works in a real-world environment, but there we compared with already known IMSI catcher attacks. Yeah, so how did the device actually did the initial attachment on the, uh, um, the carrier you know, be? Um, it basically, we toggled the flight plan, um, yeah, the um, airplane mode on and off, right. and then it connected to our base station, to our fake base station. So that's... Okay, so you, had, you, you control both the actual base station and the rock base station in an enclosure? No, we, um, the actually base station was a commercial base station. So we built a man in the middle where we had a rogue base station um, connecting to the phone and a rogue UE acting as your phone to the uplink direction. And only um, the, the, the victim's phone was in the enclosure. Yes. Okay, I, I got confused because I saw, th yeah. thought you said before both the uh, ROG in OB and the device were in the enclosure and the assumption was maybe the actual carrier in OB was outside the enclosure. The and carrier in OB was outside the enclosure. Yes. Okay. Yeah. So the ROG in OB and the device device were in the enclosure. the enclosure. Yes. Okay, so how did the actual device talk to the carrier in OB for the attachment? For the attachment, through our man in the middle. So when I, we go back... So the device didn't attach to the carrier in OB, it attached on the ROG in OB. On the... Um, so the ROG in OB had actually a connection to the yes. carrier in OB. We are in the man in the middle position, so we relay all to the control plane. So when we go here, we are in the man in the middle position. We um, relay all the control plane data, which established the mutual authentication. So all the control plane data is relayed by the relay, by the man in the middle attacker except only certain user plane traffic. And that's what we intercept here. So, so the initial attachment for the device, it assumes mutual authentication. So that means my device thinks was not attached to the actual carrier. Yes. So he's, your phone thinks on layer three, this is the actual carrier because he knows my secret. He knows the shared key of my SIM card. Yeah. But, and, and, and this is established on layer three, this is totally fine. But all the security measures taken afterwards, like missing integrity protection or missing integrity protection, allows manipulating the, sub the subsequent um, user plane traffic. And that's what we exploit. It's not clear how the actual device believes that is attaching to the carrier, in the meantime is attaching to a rogue of base station, because there, there is no okay. actual authentication, mutual authentication with the HSS in the back end. I think I, would, I can explain it to you offline, I guess. That would be um, great. I would okay. really appreciate that. Thank okay. you. You're welcome. Okay. So. <laughs>